I'm happy, happy to introduce again Dieter Meschede. He uh, will talk about uh, QLink X cooperation and, and outreach. Well, uh, thank you to Christian Deppe, and I hope you can all hear me now. And uh, I wish everybody a uh, good morning for quite a dense uh, program, which I think. And uh, so Christian Deppe asked me to talk about QLinks and cooperation and outreach. And uh, so I was uh, uh, surprised because it's kind of a meta talk rather than uh, on the uh, bolts and nuts of uh, science of the code that we do. But anyway, I think this is uh, indeed a topic which we should uh, talk with. And so let me try. I'm doing my best for this kind of a topic. So let me start actually not with uh, quantum repeaters and not with quantum communication, but with, a with my first slide. Okay, I have to see. Okay, here it goes, um, which is taken from the present uh, huge discussion in uh, also the newspaper. So here you have an article uh, which is on quantum communication by Manfred Lindinger, Lindinger who many of us know. He is a uh, an employee of the uh, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, Deutschland in quantum fever. So we have a quantum fever or so. And let me just translate what's on the right side. So the uh, exacerbating uh, question, how to distribute resources to fund which projects uh, in order to get the quantum computer uh, taking speed or so. Yeah, And as you all know, this was from December or so, uh, there was a uh, a, a committee of experts installed, uh, which contained uh, both university and non-university institutions. And they were supposed to come up with something like a recommendation they have. And uh, now the question is how this is going to be distributed. And as you see down here, then in December or in, in fall, it started that uh, Germany was buying quantum computers, Fraunhofer Gesellschaft, now also the quantum lower secondary valley is very active. And uh, I think just last week, there was another report on something going on in the Munich area and so on. So a lot of stuff is going on in quantum technology. And um, in fact, we also worked on this with the Deutsche Physikalische Gesellschaft. And already in the fall of 2019, we published a series of um, well, one page uh, info sheets or so on sensing, on communication. This is for us. This is why I framed here with these golden lines or so. This is the gold standard for uh, quantum communication or so, the quantum computer and the simulation with uh, quantum matter and so on. And uh, so we had, in fact, uh, a what we call a parliament uh, evening. So we invited members of parliament in Germany right next to the German Bundestag. Uh, to discuss with uh, science, scientists uh, on all these topics. I think it was a very nice event and it was uh, quite successful. And so you see, we do have, uh, we have gone outside and we have gone out. Um, what, the, what the impact of these actions will be, we will only understand, I think, in a number of years. So here uh, in this little conference, I think uh, we are talking about the uh, direction of quantum communication. And I will try to uh, go more in this direction. No, I will not really try to go in this direction. I will really, really try to talk about um, cooperation. And uh, in QLinks, I will not even talk much about QLinks. I will talk about uh, what we think cooperation could do in the future or so for us. So let me go. Uh, so in the general framework, quantum communication is and quantum networks is one aspect of quantum technology 2.0. And uh, there are challenges. challenges. And I think for a science, probably you all know them very well. So what we have is uh, we, most of us are working and most of you are working on hardware and still on enabling hardware. And you know the big problems. The big problems are decoherence. Is there scalability? What are the system properties? Most of us are you working uh, on components. And there is also a need for some quantum IT, a concept for quantum IT, which in its uh, bites and knots uh, boils down to uh, protocols and uh, how to implement this into bigger structures. And I think uh, we also in science are asked to invent probably new cooperative structures so that we can make use of the synergies. And uh, I think the it's up for novel applications. On the right side, I'm also showing that engineers and uh, academics, I think, need to team up in a much denser way uh, than they have done until yet to really bring this to something like a, pro, uh, a success or so. There's also challenges on the side of the society. 
the society, I think, has to make reliable sources, uh, resources available, and we will certainly need a lot of patience. Uh, I think our Minister of Health said uh, during this pandemic that we are suffering from at the moment that we may have to apologize to each other a lot uh, in the future. I think in this quantum technology uh, business, I think a number of uh, uh, promises will have to be also uh, kept in a similar way. We may have to apologize for not reaching the goals or so at the level that we are uh, promising. Society, I think, is also uh, having the challenge of educating itself about the perspectives and rises of quantum technology, which is not at the level to really have a good communicative environment yet for this uh, thing. So, a week ago, I attended, maybe one or the other from the audience here too, the uh, online session or the online precursor of a, a conference which will take place in fall. It's called QUAPS, Quantum Applications. And uh, there was a number of, I think, very interesting talks, uh, also to a large uh, extent from applicants and uh, from, from users in industry. And this sentence here appeared in several sentences. Cooperation will be the key to success in quantum technology. And I could quote here, for instance, Ben O'Boa from Q and Co uh, BV in uh, Holland, which is a company working on quantum algorithms, or uh, Thomas Strom, who also has worked with and, and visited Q-Links uh, 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 several times by Bosch Research in uh, Germany. So cooperation, I think, is a, a major thing if we want to be successful in this field. Uh, let me allude to one thing where I think cooperation can work, th that cooperation can work and that cooperation has worked. I would like to also warn you, uh, what I'm showing, I think, is a, a fa fantastic example, which we all know. Uh, it is not directly transferable to the quantum technology and not to the quantum networking aspects. However, I think it gives some ideas of uh, how cooperation could be, make, could be made efficient. So here it is. It's uh, the discovery of gravitational waves. And uh, so I, I probably, uh, I, I assume all of you remember the 2015 big event that they were also officially announced and then the Nobel Prize was uh, more or less immediately given after that. On the lower left, we see the simple scheme of a Mi Michelson interferometer and on the right side, the famous signals of the two um, of the two interferometers, which by their uh, correlation showed that we, they had observed something real. And since then, I think it has already uh, fostered a lot of new insight into our cosmos. So this is clearly only on the scientific side. Why do I think this has any relevance for us? Because as a PhD student, which I was at the, the University of Munich, uh, I actually observed the genesis of these interferometers to quite an extent. This is more than 40 years back. Uh, and on the upper left, what you see is the um, Michelson interferometer. Uh, I think it was a three meter, three meter long uh, pioneering uh, interferometer as a prototype. And uh, so um, this was still fitting into a room to more. Today it's about four kilometers each and so on. Uh, but what I want to transmit in message here is these people needed uh, and showed stamina and they also were uh, embodied in a large uh, collaboration around the work. Of course, there was a single clear goal for all of them. And so in that sense, it's very different from quantum technology. However, the way the collaborations worked, I think were uh, very impressive. I cannot resist at this point to make a remark on Heinz Billing, who probably most of you do not know. Uh, so as you see from his uh, uh, from his age dates or so, he became 103 years old and he just, just lived just long enough to witness the uh, occurrence of detecting uh, gravitational waves. And um, what I find quite fantastic, after the Second World War in Germany, he was the person instrumental to bringing computer science into the academic world and into the research world. And so I think he may be a person at the level of Konrad Suso who is much better known. And then in his uh, retirement time, he decided to uh, stimulate research on gravitational waves. So just as an example, how these things are also related to persons who push uh, certain things ahead or certain research uh, areas ahead. Let me go on. 
This is from um, a report, I think about four or five years ago from our Coolings at that time called KUCOM uh, Network. It's in uh, German, but I think you will recognize uh, what you see here. The question is, so uh, how also in the view of the fact that we have now these four columns of quantum technology, computing, simulation, communication, and sensing, how would the quantum repeater uh, make headway towards the future? And as you see in this graph, so um, there is something opening, and this opening means that uh, we have to proceed from uh, components such as quantum memories, sources of light, uh, channels and receivers and so on into something that we can call a system. And uh, when we need to put something together to make a real system which is useful for other people, then you see we have to hybridize platforms, we may miniaturize, we have to integrate systems. And on the other side, we also have to have protocols and concepts how to run the entire system. And so I think even before a quantum repeater can be really demonstrated, uh, quite a significant path in this direction must be taken. Okay, <clears throat> so the status quo and uh, what are our present aims in this quantum technology? Uh, so where, uh, for those of you not from Germany, I uh, have to, of course, uh, indicate that I'm biased by the present situation in Germany. And uh, so what happened last year in quantum technology? In June, the federal government decided to um, build a roadmap, uh, Nationale Inten Initiative Quantum Computing, uh, which was uh, to be installed. Uh, there's also the quest for an in innovation ecosystem, which should be created for international competitiveness or so. And I think this is a part where Q-Links and the future of Q-Links need to contribute to. And uh, this is not so easy. You cannot do this on command. And this is what I will try to uh, give some indications, at least from the perspective of the academic world, where we should be uh, heading. So for research and development in quantum technology, there will be up to 2 billion euros available from the Zukunftsbank by our federal government over the period of, I think it's about uh, four years or maybe a little more than four years remaining. And one reason why to go for this is technological sovereignty, uh, which is, uh, okay, it's a, a, an aspect of sovereignty, but it's also an economic necess necessity, and it serves, uh, especially with regard to cryptography and related uh, topics, also national security interests. So what happened was that there was a process uh, initiated, it was simply called agenda process, but it's taming, it's aiming at creating an agenda uh, running from 2022 to 2023 by our ministry. And I think some interesting of, uh, aspects of that are worth to be reported here. So uh, there's this agenda process. Uh, so what is the aim? It's a strategic process of the research agenda of the community working on quantum systems in Germany, connected with the European uh, layout of uh, other uh, researchers uh, throughout Europe. And it's supposed to work for a period of about 10 years, beginning in 2022. So this agenda identifies research priorities and challenges and develops guidelines for, and this is already one important thing, joint actions of industry, science, and policymakers. And uh, so it's supposed to name the relevant fields of technology and their research focus and necessary action for industry and science shall be motivated from the perspective of present and future. And this is also very important applications. So here is an outline of this agenda, which is uh, it's in German language. And the details are not important here, but you see that there are, uh, well, in this case, uh, five sub chapters. Actually, you can find everything on the internet now on uh, www.quantentechnologien.de and it's uh, quantum computing and simulation which are composed of which are put together into one system here quantum communication quantum messing sensors and then we have uh, three what we could call cross-sectional areas which is integrated quantum systems and enabling technology and also then you see uh, in the last uh, row here, education and outreach. And uh, I was involved this, in this part. And so uh, we had some actions. And uh, as I said, it's now all 
finished. It was in the fall of last year. And so let me briefly summarize uh, what has uh, happened or so. Uh, we have conducted for all of these five chapters uh, workshops, mostly online, in order to connect with the communities in depth. There were workshops for each subject and uh, guidelines for every subject were uh, well put together. And um, uh, in December 2020, there was a final discussion and approval of this draft of the uh, agenda. Uh, oh, no, it was not in December. It actually took until February of 2021. But anyway, it's finished, it's completed. And on March 23, 2021, at uh, six o'clock in the evening, uh, this agenda will now be presented to um, our Minister on uh, Research, Anja Karliczek, and it will be done by Peter Leibinger of uh, Trumpf and Emanuel Bloch of the MPQ in Munich. So this, I have to say, um, some of you may not know this also, um, there's also the, what we call the Contour, Contour Pact and the Quantum Computing uh, Strategic Agenda. Um, these are different things. So this is the long perspective. And I think especially in this quantum networking, uh, quantum network agenda, I think we have to refer more to what is going on here. And I do think that it is a good thing that we have uh, are creating a perspective for about 10 years here. So let me go on. Um, the big question in the very headline here is, how do we actually achieve significant cooperations? As I reported earlier, um, many, many people say this in their, uh, in their talks. Uh, and I quoted Thomas Strom and Ben O'Brohr. And uh, so what does the quantum technology flagship in its, on its webpage actually say about this? So they say, connect with existing trade or professional associations, promote workshops. Uh, connect potential startup creators, connect European technology and nano manipulation platforms amongst each other and so on. Develop criteria methodology for identifying use cases. Uh, you can find this at the, webs at the uh, web address, which you see below here. Uh, and that's it. I must say, I think this is very, it, it's, uh, I would be slightly critical about this because it doesn't really say what do you do? So, okay, everybody would like to have this, but how do you really do it? I'm not, I'm not claiming that I know the perfect concept, but I would like to give some directions and also to point out where I do see the problems about this. Um, so let us ask then, which guidelines could research for quantum technology follow then? So uh, these are statements which uh, I hope most of you could share. Uh, so the realization of quantum technology needs for the foreseeable future both, both basic research and mission-oriented research. And uh, it will be essential to create networks for appropriate communication. And uh, so I think uh, if we all work in parallel without properly communicating, um, it's not enough. And these communication channels must be established within the academic world and within amongst uh, major research institutions, and also with the industry. So it's relevant to bring people together at all levels and uh, also over large scales. And uh, I do think that QLINKS, uh, our network on the quantum repeater, has done a good job so far on establishing a good channel of uh, communication. So corporations are both a consequence as well as a condition for collaborative, collaborative uh, effort. And I think what we have also learned and which you will see in one of my next slides is so, it just retire, requires time. You cannot simply order people now make a network and, and work together. I think it needs time. It needs attractive aims for the individuals and also will in order to install and to install such a network and to make and to take advantage of its synergetic uh, progress uh, pro uh, options. Okay, so where are some of the problems? I mean, most of you, as well as myself, are from the academic world. And this is, I think, the romantic view, how we view ourselves as academic re researchers. So uh, what are we driving? What is driving us? So, and if you want, so uh, on the horizontal axis, there is the time and, and the vertical uh, access, there is progress by whatever measure you want to take. 
And so we have scientific questions, sometimes very specific. We want to find out the answer. Also, it's, or maybe it's a pure scientific curiosity uh, which is driving us. Uh, so this is, uh, of course, the uh, initial part and so on. Then there is the first, um, uh, the first thing, which is maybe not um, fully in line, but still largely in line. Uh, with these questions that is about funding. So for certain questions, we do get proper funding for others, not this selects already certain questions uh, and so on. And uh, in any case, so funding is something and the way funding is uh, distributed and so on is relevant. So now we are talking about quantum technology and quantum technology, in my view, is clearly a mission. It's not something that a small university group can uh, produce in its lab, it's only going to be something major if it's uh, considered a mission. And we need to team up uh, with each other and also with engineers and with other people who are knowledge knowledgeable about this. Now, this is, in my view, almost uh, orthogonal to what is in these days asked for an academic career. Uh, for an academic career, we are not rewarded in participating in a mission and solving problems, small problems, which may be very relevant to make something successful, but um, academic careers are, um, are uh, based on uh, your personal achievements and your personal achievements potentially even against uh, other people or so. And so uh, we are not educated, at least not so much in Germany to uh, do um, a good job in uh, contributing to a mission. But it can also be the other way around, I think, and you have seen this with the example of the gravitational wave uh, detection. All right. One thing, I also think that the academic world uh, should uh, take more uh, notice of is how um, yeah, market readiness is obtained in the end from basic research. So what you see here is uh, on the vertical axis a time and development uh, route or so very very coarse, of course. Uh, on the right side, you see the uh, so-called technology readiness levels. Uh, this is uh, originally from uh, space flight and uh, it originally was conceived by NASA, but I think it's very useful. And we should also in the academic world uh, get our students in contact with this to at least have an idea of what is going on. Another concept which in the uh, academic world, in my view, is very often mistaken is that uh, the, um, that the funding is uh, more or less linear uh, along this line. I think that's wrong. Typically, in order to get something ready for rollout, needs a lot more resources than we have in basic research. And I think this is something also which I think should be more widely known in the academic world. All right, uh, so then the question is, uh, efficient networks are playing a central role. How can we get them? So. Yes, workshops, I think, are a good idea, but I think they need to be jointly organized by members of the academic world, research organization, and industry from the beginning. And, uh, well, if there's networks already, such as uh, networks we have on quantum technology and photonics already, then we should cooperate. It is good to bring out flagships problems, problem, uh, flagship projects, which are open for multiple communities and uh, awarded by competition. This may be happening now with the quantum computing scheme, uh, with the conjunctural pact uh, funding or so. Another, uh, I think, good strategy could be to create for certain problems and mission initial consortial boards, yeah, with components, with competence to select members by themselves and steer the progress of corporations. And this is not so easy. I think also the uh, Expertenrat, the Expert Committee suggested something for running and, and establishing the quantum computing uh, system, but it was not approved for reasons I don't want to discuss here. Uh, but there are actually examples that these initial consortial boards, which had competence and uh, were commanding a certain funds to steer and change the uh, route that uh, collaborative efforts would work along by themselves. Uh, there was this program, uh, Innovation 2020, which was designed, I think, 10 or 15 years ago to, uh, to support the uh, establishment of research institutions in former Eastern Germany, and I think it worked quite well. Okay, so 
structuring cooperation. So cooperations also need to be structures and uh, so missions. So I think missions should address global physical and technological properties of their systems and not only one. And so for instance, in this case, uh, I think uh, collaborative efforts should have uh, the realizations based on different hardware components. This is the case, for instance, in Q-Links. Um, we also uh, will be in the future profiting from a scientific coordinator who is not a leader of any project himself. I think we need people in these co cooperative uh, um, systems who, are, who have the time to uh, also look into the system at large. And uh, I think all collaborative app uh, projects at the end of their contracts, which always have a large risk and do not always read their, reach their goals fully, should provide roadmaps, which can then in the time after this project be evaluated also quantitatively for uh, looking at the next projects. Yeah, I say here, I repeat what I said earlier, earlier I think for those people uh, working in and uh, enjoying, of course, basic research also should be requested to define technology ready levels for their systems. Most of you will find out you're in the very basic one, but I think it educates us to uh, see how the transformation from basic research and so on can happen. For the academic world, I think uh, this to, to um, at least partly overcome this orthogonality, I think we, knew, we need new reward strategies. Uh, this would be, for instance, funding of uh, permanent scientists' uh, positions and so on. Uh, because otherwise, I think, at least under the situation that we have in Germany, the antagonism, the, which is in principle, in my view, an apparent and not uh, a necessary antagonism of individual basic research and collaborative mission-oriented research could be uh, mitigated. Yeah, okay, so my almost last slide, uh, then to come back to Q-Links, um, just to show you that we need patience, or, so had, or at least Q-Links had some patience. So on the left side, you see this, my, my time error here ranges from 2000 all the way into 2020. And uh, back in the 2000s, uh, Gerd Leux had established the DFG Schwerpunkt on Quantum Informa Informationsverarbeitung. I think he deserves a lot of credit for having done this because it for the first time brought the community together. But after six years, it was over. And uh, so then DFG sa said, okay, we have funded you for six years, so now you have to do it on yourself. Uh, the other big project in this time was uh, NanoQuit, which I think was uh, very strongly supported by Klaus von Klitzing. And uh, this was on uh, semiconductor physics and uh, nanoscale systems with uh, semiconductor components, quantum dots, and so on. And there was also in parallel something which at that time in physics we had no knowledge about. Theoretical te telecommunications was working on novel concepts for uh, IT and so on. And then I think I may be slightly exaggerating. I think we had an almost four or five years discussion uh, of how to unite these efforts and to create a new program. And that happened then uh, around 2010. And then as Christian Deppe also mentioned earlier, we had a few uh, systems to work on each other. We did not know each other at that time at all. And uh, so, and we had no knowledge of who would come into these uh, projects, but we started to cooperate. And then after the first period, as you saw, as you see here, uh, we renamed our projects, not yet fully, but there was quantum Q.com, quantum uh, optics, there was Q.com semiconductors, and there was Q.com Nachrichtentechnik. And uh, then in the next stage, uh, we, uh, got rid of uh, these different projects and we made just one uh, collaborative effort. And I think that's uh, going to go, going to be the model for the future. What was new in the last period also that we got a new advisory board uh, from industry. And I think all members, what I understand, really enjoy working with us and find it highly interesting. And I, so, so I think there is a continuous evolution, but at least at the level of uh, resources we had available. Uh, it is not uh, immediate and not overnight. Okay, let me stop here and give you my recommendation. So go for collaborative efforts. It's exciting, it's challenging, it's rewarding. It creates long-term perspectives. This is, I think, something important. And uh, for quantum technology, including uh, building of networks, it will be the key so to success. 
for the academic world, which I belong to, and maybe which confines my views also, I think what we have to do is we have to seek better strategies for rewarding researchers, and we have to learn more about the industry, uh, more about the interests of industry partners. Thank you very much. Yes, okay, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, so I think we have time for some questions. So people can please use the chat or speak directly. Okay, if, if at the moment there are no questions, we have two standard questions that's new in our workshop. Um, perhaps you can <laughs> answer them. It's a little bit related to our title. Uh, so our first question is always, what do you think will be the first case for entanglement-assisted communication networks? <laughs> oh, it's in the, yeah, it's in the future. Um, well, I, I, can, I could say what I would hope for. I think it would be uh, good to, uh, to increase the security of certain uh, key components in infrastructures uh, of uh, conventional networks uh, to, to make sure they keep running even under attacks. Mm -hmm. And um, perhaps I, there's another question here, but I continue first uh, with our question we give to everyone. So uh, the next question is then related to this on the path uh, to realizing the use case. What is the current uh, main challenge in your field? Well, I think I said it already, collaborate, yes. mm -hmm. in, create networks and collaborative mm -hmm. efforts yeah. across, across all boundaries. I think that's the main challenge. Okay. 